You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. This is episode number 444 of the Mighty Blue podcast. And I'm Steve Adams on Mighty Blue, bringing you friends both new and old as they share their stories about hiking. Today, we've got another big show with four interviews, plus the next chapter of Emily Leonard's Happy Hiking, where Emily passes 100 miles right at the top of Albert Mountain. Those of you who've climbed it will certainly remember it. First up today, we welcome Heidi Nisbet to the show. Heidi's trail name is Sketch, and it's soon obvious why. I've been meaning to get Heidi on the show since I saw the Jester Wallace documentary production of Safe and Found. Heidi had provided some of the drawings for this documentary and they produced a visceral reaction from me, capturing the fear and darkness of somebody lost in the woods. Then Heidi wrote to me to tell me about another project she was working on that involved the Allegheny Trial, so I asked her to come on the show and tell us about that. Then, after Heidi, as luck would have it, we've got Jester Wallace Productions, or Julie Jester Gayhart and Austin Wallace, on the show to talk about the latest work they've been doing, also with the Allegheny Trial. It's the 50th anniversary of this trial, and they're obviously making the most of it. For those of you waiting for your Appalachian Trail fix this week, we catch up again with two of our Mighty Blue Class of 2024, with Sloggy and Lemonade giving us significant catch-ups on the progress of their respective hikes. Finally, Emily climbs Albert Mountain and passes 100 miles. Great times. Just before we start, and especially as so many of you have written to me about my heart issue, I wanted to thank you all again and let you know that I'm seeing my cardiologist on the morning this show is released. So wish me well for tomorrow, today, or yesterday, whenever you're listening. Now let's meet Heidi Nisbet or Sketch. Today our guest is Heidi Nisbet or Sketch. Thanks for coming on the show, Heidi. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, by your name of sketch you've given a bit of a clue you graduated from college i believe was it an art degree yes right yeah bachelor of fine arts what did you originally want to do with that degree oh, i didn't i i wanted to study art and then i had no idea what i wanted to do with it after but i had no idea what i wanted to do in general so i was just like <laughs> as long as i'm gonna get a degree it might as well be in something fun what did you think you could do i mean what, I, I don't um, even know what the options are if you're good at art right. that's great but what what are the options then there's there's a lot more options out there than people kind of imply and then uh, then was told to me in school either you know so we were really kind of set up to come back for our masters um and uh work potentially at a gallery or at an art museum and i did work for an art museum for a little while but um didn't really know how much sort of self-directed work could be available to me as an artist outside of um outside of those contexts and your hair obviously on a hiking show because you've done Mm -hmm. quite a bit of hiking but did you, and, and you, you're lucky, you're one of the lucky people who's combining something she loves with something else she loves to make a living, which is pretty cool as well. So how did you get to know about backpacking in general and, and the, the Appalachian Trail originally, uh, which you first, which you threw hiked in 2018? Sure, yeah. So I grew up in upstate South Carolina, not too far from it. So it was like a vague thing that I knew existed in the background, but um I had a, a family friend, uh, actually the track coach from my high school, who went out and hiked 900 miles of it um, after her kids moved out of the house. And just I was at a point in my life where I was kind of looking for some sort of direction. This was post-college in a job that I didn't enjoy and didn't know what else to do or where to go from there and was kind of like grasping for straws for some sort of something. And she went out and did 900 miles. And I was just like, that just sounds incredible just incredible. And I had no hiking or backpacking experience, but you know how that is. It just, you hear about it and it gets in your ear. And it was just one of those things that stuck with me until I ended up doing something about it. So when you first, when she went, when she did her 900 mm-hmm. miles from, from when, how long was it before you got on trial? A year or two. Okay. I forget. I think probably two years. Yeah. 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 And, and how, and how'd you go, go about preparing for it? Cause if you done like, like me, I my, my very first day hiking was the approach trail on the Appalachian trail. Never done any hiking at all. 
I did a little bit more homework than that, but not by <laughs> much. Um, I, I had been dating a guy who knew just a little bit more about being outside than I did. So we went on a few little trips together, um, just with like friends out, you know, where we'd hike a mile and basically just kind of have a party in the woods. And then I was like, <laughs> you know, I really want to go do like a hike hike. And so him and I and my dog went out and did uh, like four or five days in 2016 on the AT. Um, in November, the week of Thanksgiving, it was 12 degrees at oh night. Oh, my gosh. Never got a- above 40 degrees <laughs> and so and we were out for i think four days or something like that so if you can go out and come back from that and be like i can't wait to do this again oh, and it was a right. horrible miserable experience and you know you know it's for you if you can come back from that and want to want to go out for more so you felt that way straight away did you what was it right away what was yeah. it what was it that was getting you was it the beauty of the place because you might you have an artist's eye so what was it it was the challenge. I think it was it was the idea of like somehow people do this for six months and me doing it for three or four days is the hardest thing in the world. And if I can, if you know, there's just that's a direction to go in. Here's something to, to figure it out. Like, obviously, there's an easier way to do this. There's better gear that I can get. There's more knowledge to be acquired. Sure. So I just hyper fixated. I think I needed that in my life. I needed something to just focus. I needed a goal and a direction. And that was, you know, the, the learning process for that was, you know, just as monumental and impactful on my life than the actual through hike was. It's funny, actually, you know, le- learning, uh, I, I feel that most people can't prepare themselves for the evolution trail. They could train as much as they wish, but you start going up and down those mountains in Georgia and you're, not, you're going to be hurting and burning, you know, for the first few days, I'm sure. And I know that at the la- you got all your gear together and at the last minute you took a sketchbook. Why did you do Correct. that? Is it were you, were, Because you weren't actually intended to take one, were you? Right. Or, you know, I, I figured, you know, some sort of, I didn't think too much about that. I was so focused on the gear and making sure I had the right thing. And a journal or a book is just a journal or a book, you know. And so I didn't think too much about it. Last minute, kind of grabbed one. And then I think was a little bit more monumental was the fact that I grabbed paints last minute. Like I was just in a, like a Michaels or something. And I saw this little t- tiny travel paint kit of watercolor. And I never worked in watercolor before, but I was oh. like, that's, that's portable. I'll bring it, you know, I'll send it home you know, in Hiawassee or something, if I haven't used it by then. And I used it the first day I got my trail name. And then I was like, well, then that's kind of a reason to keep it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So did it become, Did so I don't know how what your process is. I'll ask you about it in a minute, actually. But mm-hmm. did, did the drawing become uh, a daily part of your hike or the painting in this case, become a daily yeah. part of your hike? Or did you just do it every now and then as you as you felt felt, you know, you wanted to? I did it every day to start because I was firm. I was like, don't hike more than 10 miles in the first week. Don't hike more than 12 miles a day in the second week um, because I didn't want to get hurt. And I you know, kind of had heard that that was the way to do it. So sure. the way to get hurt was to go in too fast. So um, so I was bored. You know, I'd get to camp at two o'clock and be like, I, I guess I'll draw. And so I did draw every single draw or paint every single day for the first a month or two, really. And then once I started doing my 20, like getting into consistently doing 20 mile days, then as the miles increased, the drawings decreased. Yeah. So I might work on the same drawing or, you know, fin- like start something and then finish it two days later because I just didn't have the energy to sit there and paint for more than an hour. And what do your, what do your fellow hikers think about that? Do they, do, were, they, were they kind of intrigued by this? Yeah. Well, that's a, the, the first night at Springer Mountain sitting there and painting. So I was like, you have paints? Like, where did those come from? And so that's what, you know, I got a trail name right away, um, which was actually a, a different trail name, and I, I shifted it. But my first trail name was Picasso oh. in that moment, and then later Yeah, was, that might have been a bit over the top, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, instead I was introducing myself as Picasso. I, yeah. uh, I didn't love it. So a, a little later on, actually, like after the AT is when I changed my trail name. But um it, you know, it, it did it kind of like turn some heads. And what was cool is being able to share it. Like a lot of people would pretty much everybody would ask, they assumed it was private. They're like, oh, can, I, can I look at that? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'm doing this in a public place. I'm happy to you're allowed to look at it. And I let people flip through it because I didn't put anything too personal in there. And um, that was just really cool for people to, to flip through and be like, oh, gosh, yeah, I remember that spot. I was here. Oh, is that what Charlie's Bun- Bunyan looks like? Because it was raining when I was there, you know, so it's mm. cool to share it with other people who had similar experiences experiences and be able to kind of compare so how did you do this i mean what do you draw first and then you fill, fill it in, is it like you then fill in with the paints i mean what do you do are you actually a drawer mainly because looking at the st- stuff you've done it looks like it's draw a lot of it's drawn first yeah uh, yeah yeah so it's definitely all sketched out first um and 
And then, especially because I hadn't worked in watercolor before, it's not the, that early on watercolor stuff isn't too painterly. I was kind of coloring inside the lines with watercolor. And so I will talk to people who are like, gosh, watercolor is just such a hard medium. And I'm like, if you pretend it's colored pencils, it becomes a lot easier. <laughs> so it's just sky blue, mountain, different color, blue, grass, green. And then as you get more familiar with it, you can play with more techniques. So from what you're saying, you, you would normally do it at the end of the day, the end, end of the day is or, or after two o'clock when you got there and so on. So that was, mm -hmm. I presume, from a photograph you'd taken or do you do some of it from memory? No, most of the sketchbook stuff I w would do from observation. So while I was sitting there, you know, and so it's not a whole lot of the the sweeping views. Like I didn't draw Max Patch or paint Max Patch when I was on Max Patch because I was hiking and I didn't want to stop there. So I have a lot of camp um, drawings in right. that sketchbook. Right. Now, when I'm at home and all of the artwork I do, you know, kind of the more finished and refined stuff, a lot of that's from, from photos that right. I do at my right. home studio, but on the trail doing it from observation. So it's very different subject matter. You know, the, the, First thing I do is find a comfortable place to sit. That's my that's my <laughs> main goal yeah. before I before I worry about what I'm drawing or painting, what my composition is. The first thing I need to do is make sure that my leg's not going to fall asleep on me. Well, my so first, it's a different. My, my first thought was that you'd be sitting on a rock. You've seen a great view. You're going to sit on a rock for about four or five hours, but it's not. That's not the way it works. Uh, no, not quite. I mean, sometimes like I did paint, we had nice weather at Charlie, Dan Charlie Spunyan. I'm one of the few hikers that actually had halfway decent weather through the Smokies. And, mm -hmm. um, that was my first two page. Like, so a lot of times I just paint like the one page in the sketchbook, sure. but I did, I painted across the centerfold because it was 60 degrees and sunny and beautiful. And I was like, I'm going to sit here forever. So every once in a while, if it's nice enough, you know, but you know how it is, you get into that momentum and you were planning on taking lunch somewhere else and you wanted to keep going. You just want to get to the end of your day. So a lot of times I didn't quite have the patience to to do it mid hike and wait till the end. Now, when we spoke before, you made some really, well, I first off says there's no way I would take a sketchbook because I can't bloody draw anything at all. I can do a stick <laughs> figure. That's about it. Um, but you made some really good points good points about why people should consider taking a sketchbook on their hike. Tell us about that, because that was fascinating to me. I think everyone should consider a creative practice, and I think drawing is a really awesome. Um, we, we, we don't value it, I, I feel like, in, in our society as much as we should, and I think it's something that should be taught more and something that should be incorporated into our lives more because there's a lot of a benefit. But for drawing specifically, it's a really incredible memory tool. And so if you're sitting in front of a scene, if you're at a shelter and your friends are sitting around and they're all you know eating their ramen and stuff, like you can take that picture and you can sit there and enjoy that moment. But if you sit and try to draw it, you're going to start noticing all of these minute details that you wouldn't have noticed before and you're going to ingrain those details into your memory so that's going to that's that moment and that memory is going to stay with you for so 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 much longer so there's still lives that i drew my freshman year in college that i have memorized because i stared at them and studied every single detail for like 40 hours in one week you know and so same thing if you're having an experience that you really are cherishing and you really want to hold close to you you can take that picture really quick or you can sit there and really study it. So it doesn't matter how your drawing turns out. Just the fact that you sat there and noticed those minute details of, oh, look, you can see where maybe a bear scratched. Like you're drawing the shelter, right? Sure, and then you sure. notice that the, the wood's all weathered and that maybe a bear came up and scratch, scratched at it. You know, you wouldn't have noticed that if you hadn't been drawing that section of the shelter. So you're going to notice these details and they're going to be they're going to be with you for a much longer time. You didn't did you uh, convert anybody who was hiking to, to to draw with you or paint with you? Not really. Not a whole lot. I do uh, some water some watercolor workshops. Um I, I've gotten some other artists to start drawing on trail. Like I've I've seen where they've been like, oh this is a cool setup. I'm going to bring them out. But normally they have some sort of art background already. And I have done some art workshops. Um, so those are great. Um, I've done, um, I work as a, a guide for Blue Ridge Hiking Company out of Asheville and I, uh, twice a year do a watercolor backpacking trip. Nice. And sometimes people come on that with art experience and sometimes they just come because they, that's the date that worked out for them or the mileage. They appreciated the sure. lower mileage and, um, and so uh, who's to say I always send them home with a whole blank sketchbook and like, keep doing this at home. And maybe they yeah. do, maybe they don't. Yeah. I do know of one woman who I did a workshop with um, at the at Pinhoti Fest last year who has gone on to make a whole side hustle and um, wow. do a bunch of stuff. Like wow. she just, she did it once and she's like, this is my new favorite thing. I love this. <laughs> and that's what you need. You just need that like 
disregard that fear that like, oh, I don't, it's not going to look that good. Like disregard the criticism, which is harder. That's easier said than done. But then if you can just do it and have fun with it, you get so good so quickly. Like it's like anything else. It's just the more you practice, the better you're going to get at it. And she's been doing great. She has a full website. She sets up at markets and she has some really awesome stuff that she does. And she didn't, that I know, do any art before. So this is, as, as you know, this is called Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail. And this is normally mm-hmm. about the Appalachian Trail. And even though you've done it and we've just been talking about it, this is not about the Appalachian Trail, this particular interview. Um, because once you'd finished the AT, you had this this whole bunch of uh, sketches. Did you then start to think you might be able to make a career around hiking and drawing together? Was that the, the genesis of your idea? I really wanted to. I really wanted to find a way to make adventure sustainable because it was so hard. I had to quit my job and I had to save for a year and all of that to get to the AT. And I was like, how do I make the next hike not so challenging to get to that term, to that starting terminus? Um, So I wanted to find a way that, you know, I could find a job that could keep one toe in the hiking world and um, wanted to find a way to be able to return to trails on a regular basis and not be limited to, you know, two or three weeks of PTO a year. Um, so I really kind of kept that mindset when f- trying to figure out how I wanted to go about having a job moving forward. But it was a combination of the people on the trail and the art you did and, and the hiking itself. Cause I know you were very keen on fostering community as well. And you were with the blue, uh, blue blaze Bl- uh, brewery as well. And mm-hmm. you've since gone on to hike a bunch of other trails. I presume you always take a sketchbook. What else, what, else, yeah. what else have you hiked? So I hiked the um, Pinhoti Trail in 2021. Um, I have hiked several sections of the Mountains to Sea Trail. Um, I've hiked the, uh, which is North Carolina. I've hiked the Foothills Trail in South Carolina three times. I've hiked, we attempted a Continental Divide trail through hike and we made it 700 miles. Who's we? And Who's my, we? Me and my husband uh-huh. and he broke his arm. So we went oh. home. Oh. Uh, oh. <laughs> It broke his arm in the South San Juan. So we had to go home a little early mm. on that one. Um, and then this summer I just completed an Allegheny trail through hike, which is a 311 mile trail in West Virginia. And that's actually what we're going to talk about in a moment. Uh, yeah, but, be, yeah, I'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. But one last question I'll ask about that. When mm-hmm. you look at your pictures from the first hike, can you see how your style has evolved over the years? And do you see oh, things, and, and, is it, is, and you're obviously going to say it's got better and I understand that why, but what do you see improving? Um, I think patience actually has become a big, um, a big improvement where, you know, it's, I I think that's the biggest like lesson to learn as an artist is if you rush it and different styles, that might not be the case, but the way that I create stuff is like, if I rush it, it's gonna, you know, it's to to sit down and really be patient and just say, just take the time to do it, do it right. You know, it it, it can turn out a lot better. Um, I've also gotten a lot like pretty into, um, uh, like naturalism, I guess, like flora and fauna, you know, right, learning right. my wildflowers and my mushrooms. And sure. so um, incorporating yeah, you've this got some great stickers. that I'm gaining. You've got some great stickers on your website as well. I know they're pretty yeah, cool. if you they're, like mushrooms, come check them yeah, out. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, and as I said, this interview isn't actually about the Appalachian Trail. Today we're going to be talking about the Allegheny Trail. And you've recently completed through hike of that trail and you were commissioned mm-hmm. to sketch along the way. That must have been the perfect gig for you. How, how did that come about? It was an idea that I had in my brain, like hiking the Appalachian Trail on this, like, how do I make adventures sustainable? How do I make a living doing this or make a living that allows me to do this? And that was just kind of an idea I had. Artist residencies are not a foreign concept. That's a thing that exists and has existed for a long time. And the National Park System does an artist residency where they give an artist an opportunity to step away from their daily life, to come be in their natural spaces and be inspired by their landscapes and then to create some artwork inspired by that. Right. And so I reached out to the West Virginia Scenic Trails Association and I just said, Hey, here's this idea. Here's this concept that already exists. That's concept of artist residency. And what if we merge it with a through hike and how can that benefit you? And then how can that give me an opportunity to do something that I've really wanted to do, but just needed, you know, the excuse to carve out the space and the time to do it. And what was their, you know, when you approached them, what was it? Well, obviously they gave you the gig. So what was their general response? What were they looking to do? 
Um, so they have been, the trail's been around for 50 years and this year they celebrate their 50th anniversary. So this was the year, this has been a year for them to kind of like recheck in and say like, what can we do differently? How can we grow? How can we expand? What can we celebrate that we already have? And so there's just a lot of energy around it because it's a 50th, right? And, um, they, by the way, did you know that? When you approached I, them. I did. Yeah, actually, that's <laughs> why I, I did reach out to them um, through a connection with Jester, actually. had Jester got a jig with, gig with them doing yeah, yeah. A, a trailer for the film, it, uh, right. for the trail. And I was like, oh, are they are they trying to get a little bit more attention right now? And she's like, yes, they're making a conscious effort to get more eyes on the Allegheny Trail and then eventually more feet on the Allegheny Trail. And I was like, I'm going to reach out to them. This sounds like an opportunity to do this thing that I've been thinking about for six years. Good thinking. I think that's a great idea. I really do. And in your original email to me, you refer to it as an underloved trail. Um, underloved. Why do you think that is? Why is it underloved? It, it kind of, I don't know really the history, but it, it just seems like I just didn't hear about it. You know, I've been pretty in the hiking world for six years and listening to all the podcasts and following all the the hiking influencers and the YouTube channels and just I'm, I'm in, in this world. And I'm like, nobody's talking about this trail. And I think that's um, the, yeah, just, it just not a lot of people hiked it. And then when you don't have this established, you know, a, a lot of consistent people hiking it, then it kind of, you know, there's a momentum that happens with trails and, and getting them more, more attention and more hikers and stuff. So it, was, it just, kind of seemed like nobody was out there. So nobody was going out there because they didn't really have anybody else. Right. I, I don't know. Other hikers might do this differently, but I love, like, I want to read a blog or a YouTube channel or something beginning to end before I decide I'm going to hike a trail. I want to know what I'm getting into. Right. I just right. don't want to, I don't want to do it blind. And so what did, so you came to them with the idea, but they gave you the mm-hmm. brief, I presume. They told you what they wanted. Well, they, obviously they wanted to show off the, the trail in the best light. How did you go about, doing the work you've done I've seen because your pictures are now on the website and they look great so how, how did you what was the brief in the first first case um you know I, I had one volunteer that I specifically worked with and she was super excited from the beginning so she was real like really in my corner and willing to figure out how can we present this to the board in a way that they're going to be excited about it and so she gave me ideas of like what they were looking for but my you know my case was kind of the same you know I didn't say like I want to come in and do these uh, I came in and said, I want to do paintings from observation on the trail. I want to carry large paper on the trail. Like this is this idea that I've had and it can benefit you in this way. And so we went back and forth, you know, on, on package ideas and what could be afforded and and what would make the most sense to do. Um, And we just kind of had a lot of back and forth and really tried to outline. Here's the benefit and the long-term value and here's how you can use this to continue to benefit your trail long after i've finished the hike and finished the paintings and um and and this is how we can help you to help you to grow and did you know much about you know the the general um the information about the trial for example how long is it before you start did you know you obviously knew how how long it was and and when did you start yes it's 311 miles and i started it on june 12th Um, and this, you know, I actually didn't have a really great idea. You know, I I know West Virginia a little bit and, uh, you know, found a few things out on the internet about it, um, and knew I could expect a lot of it to be, you know, it's Appalachia. It's going to be from a visual perspective, similar, but different the way that all that Appalachia is, you have these like sub sub regions that are going to be a little bit different, but it's a, it is a green tunnel when it's a green tunnel, which I love, love the green tunnel. (laughs) Um, I knew that there was a good bit of road walking on it. And I was very pleasantly surprised to find that that road walking was very different than actually what I expected. The Pinhoti trail has a lot of road walking as well. And, um, you're saying there, there wasn't much traffic on it, there was it? You said it's back. Country, there's no, back yeah, country. yeah, yeah. There is no traffic and there is no dogs. So, so in comparison to the road walking I had done prior, I was like, oh, this is lovely. I'll do this all day. <laughs> uh, and compared to the hiking I've done, like I, I really enjoyed the road walks of the Allegheny Trail. They were absolutely beautiful. It's all through these rural backcountry roads and old barns and hay bales and cows, <laughs> and it was just stunning. Like it was, it was a break from from that green tunnel that we're used to. Are there, tra- so are there to, trail, t- trail towns to go through as well? 
Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. How many, yeah, yeah. I mean, so where do you start and where do you finish? And, and do you go through, how many trail towns do you go through? So it starts at the uh, Pennsylvania border, Mason-Dixon line, a little bit south of Pittsburgh, a little oh, bit east it starts of actually Morgantown. At, at the Mason-Dixon line. Nice. I didn't even mm-hmm. know that. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. right on the border. Yeah. And then 311 miles is pretty much just due south. It's kind of that that eastern side of the state. And you end at um, the intersection with the Appalachian Trail near Peters Mountain. Right. Um, so, right. so you finish on the AT and it's three miles from the closest parking lot, actually. So, um, so technically up to how 314 miles. So you told us there was backcountry roads, no green tunnel and so on. So what did it what was what was the feel of it? Cuz cuz you actually told you actually told me you kind of had a bit of a feeling it was a bit like how Grandma Grandma Gatewood would have done the yeah. Appalachian Trail. So tell us what you mean by that. Sure. So I, I just read that book for the first time, which uh, probably should have read it a lot sooner and I really enjoyed it. And it was interesting reading it and they're talking about how she's like sleeping on picnic tables and knocking on people's doors. And I'm just like, what, how, when is she, how is she doing that? The Appalachian Trail doesn't go through anybody's front yard. It's all on public land, like way, way, way out far from homes. And then I realized like, no, the Appalachian Trail used to have an entirely different route. You know, they sure. really didn't start shifting it to being all trail and off of those roads until way later. Um, so, so when she hiked it, that is how it went. And it's kind of like this experience of just being this like vagabond and another time walking, you know, just like it, it didn't feel like a parts of it didn't feel like a hike. And I don't say that in a bad way. It just felt like a, like more of a journey, like more of a, I'm walking across this state and it you know, because it wasn't a trail at parts and a lot of it is a trail. Right. right. Um, but those roadwalk sections, especially in the northern part, it's just kind of like you're walking through these rural backcountry roads and it just it feels like another time. And we are interacting with the locals, you know, the people, you know, have granted permission to sleep at this community building or at this old school oh, building. Right. Nice. And people are driving by and they've stopped. And so a lot of people knew what we were doing, actually. And they were, and a lot of people didn't, and they would ask, and they were just like, "Oh, that's so cool! Do you need water? Do you need beer? Do you need a place to stay?" <laughs> and so it's these authentic interactions that really reminded me about what I read about her experience hiking the AT in the sixties, and um, not an experience that I had had on a trail yet. So, who were you hiking with? It you said we. You, who were you actually hiking with? Um, so I was hiking with uh, my hiking partner and good friend. His trail name is Gray Squirrel. He, um, I met him on the AT. We hiked together for two days, and um, we hiked the Pinhoti Trail together as well. Oh. Um, great guy, great friend. Retired, so he can hike with me when I call and ask. For some reason, <laughs> all of the people my age have jobs, so when I call and ask if they want to go hiking for a month, they're like, yeah. I can't do that. There you, you know? go. There you go. <laughs> so Gray Squirrel is my go-to. He's a great hiking partner. And when we spoke for it, I, I did ask you about wildlife on the trail, and obviously you're on roads – you probably saw a little bit less, but you said you saw a lot of deer out there. Oh, I think I actually saw more wildlife, you know, and especially on the road. I mean, these are roads without any, any traffic. And you've got these wide open meadows, right? So you can, A, you can see so much more. Um, so we oh. saw so many deer, hundreds and hundreds of deer. We saw three bear. We th- we saw three rattlesnakes. I saw an otter. I saw a beaver. I've never seen an otter or a beaver in <laughs> 5,000 miles of backpacking. Nice. Um, and... Yeah, some other like smaller critters, some cool birds, um, and different stuff like that. But we we counted, we were counting how much bear scat we saw. There was so much bear scat all over the trail because they don't. There's not hikers on this trail, so the bears don't know to be afraid of hikers or to stay off of the trail or whatever. And I counted 28 piles of bear scat on the trail (laughs) in one day. Did you paint it? It's everywhere. (laughs) I should have. I should have. I might still. (laughs) How's that for a sticker? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what's the logistics like in terms of uh, you can resupply in towns, obviously. Um, Mm -hmm. So you could literally go without needing to pack food for more than a day or two. Could you do that? Yeah. um, So three or four days probably between towns. I hiked a little bit slower than I normally do because I wanted the time to paint on this trail. I needed a little bit more time. Um, And um, I did send a resupply package to two different towns because they're such, such small towns Mm. that they might not have a full grocery store. But uh, West Virginia has this really, really awesome thing called a pepperoni roll. Do you know about this? No, I don't know. If they sell them at every single gas station. It's like it came from like the coal mining industry there where it was just an easy lunch for the wives to pack. And it's just cheese and pepperoni on 
a piece of bread wrapped up and they're delicious and they're the best hiker snack because they're just, <laughs> you can just grab like six of them and there's lunch and dinner for, for three days. Like they're incredible. Um, so yeah, we had no problem, no problem resupplying. I, I sent a resupply to two towns and I could have gotten away with not having to do that. Hmm. And, and so is it's logistically it, easy. And is it all wild camping or is are actually some other, some shelters out there? I mean, what's the infrastructure like? There was a lot more infrastructure than I really expected, more so than I'm used to for trails of that um, length. I forgot to mention earlier when you asked, I've also hiked the Superior Hiking Trail in Minnesota. I knew I was missing one. <laughs> Same exact length, 311 miles and way up in the North Country where you'd think they'd have more shelters and way more shelters on the on the Allegheny Trail. Oh, right. Um, and I think more shelters than the Pinhoti as well, or at least similar. There's like maybe eight, something like that pristine condition all of the shelters really looked great they had some awesome bridges um we didn't deal with high water when we hiked but i know it can be an issue earlier in the spring yeah, yeah. or during a wetter year um and yeah so that the infrastructure was awesome yeah and having loved the community on the appalachian trail did it feel like a lonely trail to you or i know you're with somebody but did it but did it feel quite a lonely trail because you said you didn't see many other through hikers did you Yes, we saw, we ran into two other hikers that were out for a section going the other way. And then we did meet three sisters who were through hiking the other way. Um, but we went out of our, like I had been emailing with them. So I wouldn't have seen them if I hadn't like made arrangements to meet up with them in town. Um, it, you know, it, it did. Yes. Compared to the AT, but you know, our Pinhoti hike, we didn't see that many people either. Um, so I, I think, you know, if your expectations are in the correct place, it didn't feel lonely because I expected not to see that many people. And we saw a lot of, we had, a, we had most days we had interactions probably with people nice. like, like not through hikers, but people that were out and about in some sort of way. And, and I only thought about this question, put it in the very last minute, actually. Most of us, when we go out on a trail, we've got a, our hike is the reason for being there. How different mm -hmm. is your mindset when you're actually working out there? Did the sketches sometimes interfere with the hike or that was just part of what you were doing? You know, I, I definitely, I expected, like I went into this knowing, okay, this is, you're adding something by having a different goal besides finishing. But I work as a guide as well. So I'm used to hiking and thinking beyond just like, let's get to campy dinner, pack up and leave the next day, right? I'm used to having responsibilities while I'm hiking as a guide. And so um, I felt like I was pretty prepared for it. Um, I got really homesick, like right away. Like as soon as I got out there, I was like, crap, I really miss my husband and my dog. <laughs> and so there was this sort of like, it's like I can sit here and I can finish this painting or I could pack up early and hike a few extra miles. And if I do that enough times, maybe I can finish one day early. And so <laughs> unfortunately there was this kind of like, thing where it's just like I wanted to and, and I think that even behind besides the homesickness it's just like that's the through hiker mentality you get to the place we're goal oriented people sure. we wanted there's a finish line we want to get there um but we definitely we definitely went a lot slower than I normally do we took more zeros than I normally do and I worked on those paintings on the zero days and stuff and um but I did end up working more at home like came, coming home to finish the paintings oh, right. more okay. um i i for some reason i thought i would be content to sit on trail for six hours but you can't sit in the dirt the lighting changes too much you're gonna need to work from a photograph eventually anyway so there was more than i expected of me working at home when i finished to finish up those paintings but i think there's a huge benefit to the artwork to have been started um in plein air right in from observation I'm sure it was, that, but interestingly, and once again, I'm just thinking as I'm think as I'm just thinking about this question. When you you say you set up, you sit on a chair or whatever you sit on when you get comfortable. Do you take a picture of exactly where you are because that's what you're looking for? So when you get back home, you have to have that, exactly that picture, don't you? Yeah, I'm supposed to. I should, <laughs> and I, I did for the most part. But there was one that I forgot to. And oh, I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yeah. So you got back. You finish the trail, and, and 300 miles is not a short trail either. It, mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it takes takes a while. And you took just under a month, is that right? Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. What did the Allegheny Trail think of the pictures? I just I just sent them to him. Um, uh, so I haven't really gotten to talk to everybody yet, but the main volunteer that I was working with had a lot of positive feedback, and then right. I just posted it to the Allegheny Trail Facebook page. And um, that was I posted them, all 10 of them, and I was like, 
tell me, tell me which one's your favorite and why. And I love asking a question because then I get engagement and response. And so, um, and that's not, you know, that Facebook group is not as big as some Facebook groups for other trails. And so normally I post in there and it's like, you get like two or three likes or comments or whatever. And I, there, there was a bunch of engagement with that post, you know, so it's cool. And everybody's kind of in the comments chit chatting. Oh, I stayed here that one time and da da da. So it was really well received on the Facebook yeah. page as well. Well, um, I, t- so. I, t- I would have cut that question out had they not liked them. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I checked out your website. It's called sketching summits.com, which is great by the way. And and I'll have, the, I'll have the link to it in the show notes where people can see your work. What do you do? I mean, you do, you do these, you hike, you, do these things but you also do something you send you a picture of, of a couple uh, catarden or whatever you'll you draw that for them will you and paint that yeah for yeah them. yeah so so and that's definitely how i started like my career as an artist was mostly with commissions and so i do still take those and have done dozens if not hundreds of those at this point um those are great. I love doing them. Um, I do also like, I love taking some odd jobs. So I worked with Jester and, uh, Austin Jester Wallace productions on the safe and found documentary, which I know you've talked about on this podcast before. Um, so it's just really cool to have opportunities like that pop up. And then last year I started doing murals. Um, so I have a mural at the, I don't know if we talked about this before. I have a mural. You're up a ladder. When when I, when I was going to interview, speak to you first time, you're actually up a ladder, paint the mural. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> on a scaffold, yeah. That's right, scaffold, um, yeah. It was on a scaffold. I was yeah. like, let me call you once I get down from here. <laughs> um, so I've, I've done a handful of murals, the first one being at the uh, commission by the ATC at, in Damascus at the new trail center there in town. Wow. Um, wow. So I have three in Damascus, one in Kramer 10, no, four in Damascus now. And then um, I'm doing one in Durban, which is one of the trail towns on the Allegheny Trail. So I get to go back to West Virginia for that in August. Um, and we'll have another one in Stallings, North Carolina later this fall as well. So do you ever think about what the next five years could bring? And the reason I say that, I mean, I was thinking about this this morning. If these work out well for you, you know, there must be other trails would love that sort of thing as part of what they do as well. They, you know, they'd have rights to sell, do postcards and stickers and stuff like that, which you could sell and, do, and reproduce mm-hmm. and do a deal and so on. And it's a worldwide issue, isn't it? There's so many flipping hikes around. You could do be anywhere. Have you thought about what you might do or are you looking to expand further or are you, are you pretty much where you want to be? Yeah, yeah. I really um... – I, I like I liked the concept. There's there's parts of what I did that I would probably change um, a little bit, but I you know that's what I do. I paint trails and I paint you know I paint nature. A lot of people paint nature, but I paint the hikers' experience. And so I think it's like there's just a really good opportunity for like me t- to help someone and them to help me. Like it's just mutually oh, beneficial. Yeah. Um, hopefully, you know. So there's still elements of this that we're, we're figuring out and we're, we're, you know, kind of closing up this whole experience, um, through the, their 50th anniversary celebration, which is in September, which is a big festival that, you know, that they're going to be having in Green Bank, West Virginia. And I'll be there with the original paintings and they'll have the prints and everything for sale. Um, so getting through that and then, you know, would love, you know, some more feedback from them about, you know, what they might change. And then there's some things like one thing for me that I, felt important for me for this was like, I'm going to paint large paintings, like larger than would be normal for painting while backpacking. So I did 16 by 20 inches, Mm. had them rolled up and carried them in a mailing tube. And in hindsight, I just really don't think it was necessary for them to be that large. I think I really could have done, like, I don't think anything would have been lost for them to have been perhaps eight by 10 or maybe 11 by 14. Um, So just for some reason in my head, I was like, they have to be big, bigger is better. And then (laughs) I finished, I was like, I really don't think that they needed to be. So, um, and I don't, you know, know necessarily that they need to be painted on trail. Maybe painting from photographs could be more beneficial and stuff. But it's just like something I wanted to explore. But I definitely um, hope that I have the opportunity to continue to collaborate with with trail organizations. I bet and, you do. You can become, um, a, you can effectively yeah. <laughs> become a professional hiker, couldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, is, yeah. that is so damn cool. Well, look, people know on this show, I love, I love it particularly. Uh, when women take on a trail and embrace it the way you have, and the fact you combined it with a job, and man, you've really got it going on right now. But I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your story with us. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Take it easy, okay? Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. I love the way she made the argument for taking a sketch pad. I mean, I still can't draw, but it's the observation that sears the view in your memory. Made sense to me. 
Funnily enough, I've seen a few people out there drawing and they all looked happily absorbed. Maybe I'll try it one day. Let me know if any of you do that while you're hiking and send me one of your drawings. I'd love to see it and we'll post the best ones on the Hiking Radio Network Facebook page. I thought the trail sounded great with what Heidi described as good road walking. Having walked along a few quiet roads on my recent UK hike, I get it. And these sound even more rural, so I also understand the Grandma Gatewood comparison. So, keeping the Allegheny Trail in mind, let's catch up with Jester and Austin as they tell us what Jester Wallace Productions are up to these days. Here they are. Well, on the same theme of the Allegheny Trail, we've got a couple of old friends. And one particular old friend, not that I'm calling her old, but this is uh, Julie Jester Gayhart. Hey, Julie, how are you? Hey, Steve. Great to be back on the show with you. And I just want to say before we get started, congratulations on your hike. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and also, Austin Wallace. Hey, Austin. How are you? How's it going? How's it going? Uh, it, it's going okay. I'm getting done. So you're getting, getting it all worked out. Um, so the uh, this, this kind of show is mainly about the Allegheny Trail. And you guys have got a little story to tell. Um, you're releasing a new documentary. Tell us how it came about. Well, uh, quite honestly, it came from Justin Mullins um, after he saw the I Am The MST uh, video series that we did and then the final hour and so video series that Austin put together about the Mountains of Sea Trail. He reached out to us over a year ago now oh, wow. and said that they were wanting the Allegheny Trail um, or the West Virginia Scenic Trails Association, rather, we're wanting to put something together um, and have a video, a documentary, a short film, whatever you want to call it, and a little trailer, kind of like what we did for the Mountains of Sea Trail, sure. and they loved it so much. And that's really how it got started, and conversations um, kind of went back and forth um, a couple times, and then we were off and rolling and filming last summer. So the majority of the filming that we did for that was last June. And then we did some filming in October. All right. Okay. And now how, how do you approach um, a gig like this then Austin? You're the, you're generally the cinematographer. So how, how did you approach that, that this sort of gig? Uh, it was a challenge. Uh, Cause one of the, one of the uh, benefits uh, that we had with the MST project was that both Julie and I were, were already familiar with the trail. We already, we already were very, uh, in tune with what the MST was and the organization around it. Uh, and uh, I had a whole bunch of film already uh, from just hiking the trail. All right, so yeah. uh, approaching the Allegheny Trail project, uh, we were starting from scratch with, with nothing. Well, you say you're starting from scratch, but do they give you a brief when you, when you, when you set out? What are, they, what, what are they looking for? They say to you, just do something like you did on the MST. Because that you, was, you that don't, was pretty similar, yeah. You kind of don't want that to a degree, do you? Because you want have its, it needs to have its own special character, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and they gave us kind of some, some left and right limits. So, you know, they, they said they wanted uh, like a 10 to 15 minute um, kind of promo video right. along with like a short two minutes. So that kind of gave us some framework to work within. Sure. Uh, so I didn't have to worry about, you know, finding hours and hours and hours of footage. Uh, we still ended up with that. No, but, of course you did. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen you, I've seen you in action, man. <laughs> but I, I know how that sort of thing works. And actually, of course, it, it was the 50th anniversary coming up. So I suppose yes. you can frame it around that. Is that how, you, how you've done it? Yeah. So that was, that was part of it. Um, the, the folks, uh, Justin, uh, Nicole, a whole, a whole bunch of those folks, uh, were very helpful and kind of like getting us in tune with first who we need to talk to, who, ne who needs to be the voice, uh, or the voices sure. in this video. Uh, and so once we kind of had that list and, and, uh, we were able to get up a bunch of them in one place last June, uh, for one of their, uh, they actually call it, uh, a W five weekend, and I, I am. It's the woods. Woods wacky week, week of, of work and relaxation. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> relaxation. Yes. Relaxation, <laughs> but they're not relaxing at all. They're out. I mean, a hardcore trail building, trail maintaining. When we were there for that weekend, they were building a brand new bridge. Um, I will say one of the things, one of the parameters that they gave us is they wanted the history of the trail. They wanted um, kind of a before, current, and future hmm. of the actual, where they see the Allegheny Trail going. 
And in the 10 minute or 11 minute film that will be released in September, that is really the what encompasses um, kind of what they asked us to do. So we talked to a lot of people that are some originators of the trail. We talked to some people that are currently hiking, volunteering the, for the trail, and then kind of got their vision of what they want to see in the future. Right, right. So uh, knowing you, as I say, Austin, you probably have got a lot of lot of footage. Is there is there a knock-on effect of that? You know, you've got so much stuff, you can got to squeeze it into 10 minutes. You've probably got a lot of good stuff you could squeeze into another couple of hours, couldn't you, or several other documentaries. How do you repurpose stuff or are you not repurposing stuff? Uh, it all goes in, in the bank. Um, it's, yeah, that honestly, that is the hardest part of the edit uh, is first going through all the different interviews and kind of finding those nuggets right, uh, right. of uh, and so that, you know, you can use them. Um, but then, man, it gets really tough when it some, comes time to start cutting stuff because, yeah. uh, you know, it, that's, you know, trying to tell a story succinctly, uh, but still tell it completely. That was that was the challenge. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the uh, the all the, the raw footage and everything is there so that, you know, if we if we decide to do another project down the road uh, <laughs> or, or the Allegheny Trail needs needs footage down the road, they've got it. Uh, so it's not going away. It's just that just didn't make the cut for this particular project. So how long did you spend out on the trail then, Julie? Uh, f- for the film th- itself, yeah. we spent, I believe, the first weekend, it was um, two and a half, three days, mm. and then another full day. So I'd say about five days total. All right, cool. Um, out interviewing. And one of the things about interviewing is you can inter- buddy, interview somebody for the majority of the people we interviewed were probably for about an hour a piece. Right. And then you go back through those interviews and hope they say some form of nugget that will fit with the next person's story neat. that you interview. Yeah, neat. And, you know, some people that we interview, um, you know, you feel really bad, like Austin was saying, it, you know, something they just didn't say what we needed them to say when it came down to hmm. trying to figure out the final story. Sure. And you, you, you're a hiker, obviously, and, and I know recently you've been been hiking again. So, what, what did the Allegheny Trail come across like? How was it for you? For um, you? For me, yeah. it reminds me of uh, good old Southern Appalachian hiking. Hmm. Um, you know, like if you compare it to the Appalachian Trail, which they do. I mean, the Southern Terminus is right there, just ten miles north of Perrysburg, Virginia. So when you hike out of Woods Hole Hostel going north on the AT um, and you go past the town of Perrysburg, you pass the southern terminus Uh. of the Allegheny Trail. Uh. So all that terrain around Woods Hole, um, just, you know, up and down, you know, straight up, straight down, but still clear brown path. Yeah. And as you get north, you know, it terminates on the border of West Virginia and Pennsylvania. And uh, Austin can speak to this because Austin has uh, paddled the river that (laughs) goes beside the trail. All right. Um, And Austin could attest to what the northern part of the trail um, is like. And I'm actually looking forward to hearing this episode because we're going to hear all about it from Heidi because Heidi just uh, threw hike to the trail. Yeah. Yeah. She absolutely, absolutely loved it. So, I mean, we kind of just hit the highlights for the video. Yeah. And, and I understand why that would be a, as well. So you, I've seen the trailer. The trailer looks great, by the way. So what's the, what's the plan? You, you, what's distribution like? And by the, by the way, I presume they've seen the main film, the whole film, have they? Mm-hmm. Yes, and yes. Was it good? the main film does exist. Was it? No, well, it I'm good. sure it does exist, but it's whether or not they saw it yet. And and is the reaction been good so far? Yeah, we've had uh, nothing but positive results, uh, positive feedback from from the Allegheny folks. Uh, we uh, we put together the trailer uh, and you know sent it to them. Hey, what do you think? You know, like you know, if there's is there something that need to be adjusted, anything like that, uh, and all thumbs up. And then same thing uh, when when we finally made it through the the uh the main film uh nothing but but thumbs up the whole way so that's cool uh it's yeah it, it always feels good to you know because it's 
it's a fair amount of work, even though it's an 11 minute video. I know it's uh, a fair amount of work. Could there, have bloody, a, bloody <laughs> work you must have done to put put our woods old stuff a, together. Oh my god! Oh yeah, it still makes me still makes me uh, break out in a, in a hot flush actually <laughs> when I think about the work you must have done to, done for that. I wake up in cold sweats every now and Quite then. Right so. Quite right, sir. <laughs> so, so what's the plan? It gets released on a particular date or an event. What's what's going to happen? Yeah, so uh, they are they're going to have a whole big um, celebration uh, at the uh, Green Bank Observatory. Uh, I want to say it's the first weekend in September this nice. year. Nice, uh, And that's going to be the 50th anniversary uh, celebration, a uh, whole weekend out there. And uh, then they're going to show the film out there for the first time, let everybody see it for the first time. So it's going to be cool that that uh, everybody will be, you know, right there on the trail at, at the observatory. Uh, and and the observatory itself is actually a, a cool little landmark. Um, it's a it's a radio telescope. Uh, I know. And so I know. It's I know just this massive uh, structure out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so it's just kind of a cool little little uh, point on the map, but I just think it's neat that that's where it's going to be shown. So what happens after that? This once it's once it's shown, do, how do people access it, or do they access it? What happens? It'll be uh, it'll be on our uh, YouTube channel, the right. Jester Wallace Productions YouTube channel, right. and uh, and then wherever uh, the Allegheny Trail uh, folks want to want to post it, uh, it's it's their video, and so they can they can put it up on the, on their website sure. or wherever. Sure. And I'm always interested in these things. You know, you've got a, 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 a growing business and you've got different trails you want to see. And this country is actually replete with trails. There are tons and tons of things out there. Oh, Have yeah. you got options to do other different places? Is this, is this How do you see it? Jester Wallace is actually growing. That's a good question. Um, so honestly, uh, the beauty of it is, is Austin and I both have full time regular day. Oh jobs. yeah, you work. What's that? All, what's that all about? Yeah, I know <laughs> we we work. And the original uh, premise behind Jester Wallace Productions is almost like um, interviewer podcaster meets you know video production, mm. and that's how we formed. And we always said that number one, we don't want to overwhelm ourselves. Number two, we have regular jobs. We're not out there trying to pursue avenues just to make money. No. And we want to do this because we have a passion for it. We want to have fun and we want to make an impact. And I believe with our three films that we have now, including um, the Woods Hole Hostel Weekend, we have made a very strong impact on the Mountains of Sea Trail. They still host our film on their website. Yes. Um, our film, Safe and Found, about hiker safety and featuring the Haywood County Search and Rescue Team, just hit over 14,000 views. Nice. And that film has also been shown out in uh, Colorado and was part of a fundraiser out in uh, Pagosa Springs, Colorado. And they raised over $10,000 for their a search and rescue team by showing the film and having an event based around the film. And we got to show uh, safe and found at Damascus trail days. Yes, yes, and we're also going to be showing um, uh, safe and found at Alda this year. So we were invited to come to Alda and show the film. And I could be not, I couldn't be any happier with the work that we've done because the impact that three, that these three individual films have made um, already. And we're just getting started. So we have a potential to work with another nonprofit um, that has reached out to us. And we've been kind of going back and forth, trying to work that out, see if it works for us, see if it works for them. And uh, I think we got a couple other ideas, Austin, that um, we've been uh, brewing in the back of our minds. But the good news is, is these are we get to do these projects because we want to, we don't have to. Yes. You know what? That's a great attitude to have as well, obviously. And what you are doing, of course, is giving back to hikers anyway, which I know will fill you with joy, certainly, Julie, and I'm sure it does you, you Austin, as well. Do you think you're improving, Austin, as a video <laughs> as a videographer? I, I, I would I would like to think so. <laughs> all right, all right, I should ask Julie. Then. No, no. Do, do you think it, do you think it's important? Do you see things in this one? That you may you may think oh that I've done well there I've done that better than my, I may have done in the past. I never stop self critiquing, uh, so yeah. I, I 
sometimes the the improvements are incremental right um but I, I like to think every you know each each project we work on is just a little better than the one that's previous so yeah well look i'm okay austin's not going to tell the truth <laughs> on this um austin will spend hours <laughs> on like uh especially for safe and found on some digital art you know heidi also did the digital art right. for our film safe and yeah. found but what Austin did with the digital art afterwards uh, to make it move throughout the film, that was all Austin. Even the editing or the uh, final edit in Safe and Found, uh, what Austin did with the credits, hours, hours and hours and hours. And Austin's never going to say this, but I will. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's not, it looks easy when you're reading, you know, the beginning of a film or the ending of the film where there are credits and, you know, there's things moving throughout, but that takes hours of uh, creativity and Austin has 100% improved. I can look at the, I am the MST film versus the Allegheny film and see major improvement. So I'm going to give Austin the kudos on that. <laughs> part of the hours is because I have no idea what I'm doing and I'm learning in the process. So <laughs> I think, Well, that's all part of it. I think you've got a rough idea. Uh, are you still, by the way, you're still hitting the drone in a big way? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> well, look, guys, I wish you every success. And I think what you're doing is a phenomenal contribution to the community. I, I, I genuinely think our podcasts, Julie, are a contribution to the hiking world. I think your films equally and probably more in many ways are going to have an impact. So for us to leave an impact on the hiking community, I think it's a, it's a joy for us to do. And I, and I appreciate you to come in on and tell me your story. Well, appreciate you having us. Thanks, Steve. You know, it's always a pleasure to see you. Okay, girls. See you soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Austin, he's so laid back. But Julie's right. The work he puts into this stuff is so exacting. And he kind of goes the extra mile to get it right. The two of them are building something to be proud of. So I've added links in the show notes to the website and a direct link to the Allegheny Trail trailer. Check them out and give them some love. Thanks to those of you who wrote in last week, having enjoyed my interview with Glenn Van Pesky. Several of you came up with the right answer to my question, which was Ray Jardine, the bloke Glenn mentioned as being recognised as the originator of the ultralight backpacking movement. Everybody got it right, so I had to draw the various entries out of a hat, and the winners were Dave Santee and Kristen Lorenzen. Kristen was so confident that she sent me her address, though I still need yours, Dave. I'll send them on to Glenn for him to mail you a signed copy of his book. Thanks to all of you who wrote in, and thanks to Glenn for his generosity. Now, let's switch back to the other AT, the Appalachian Trail, and our Mighty Blue Class of 2024. First up, we hear from Bobby Campbell, or Sloggy, who's speaking to me from the top of Bromley Mountain. Hey, Steve, good morning. Hey, how are you, Sloggy? I'm doing awesome. Doing people, awesome. People tell me I, sh I should be using people's trail names more often, so I thought I'd call you Sloggy today. I normally call you Bobby, but uh, um, you're doing well. Uh, and is that well as in miles, or you're still just having a great time? Yeah, both, actually. Um, you know, we're, we're still doing some big miles on certain days, but we're definitely getting a little strategic um, to make sure that we're getting the most out of it. You know what I mean? No, tell, no. Tell, well, I, I kind of do, but tell tell everybody else what you mean by that. Well, so example, we saw on Far Out, um, and and just heard, you know, uh, AT rumor mill that the town of Bennington, mm -hmm. Vermont, was doing their second annual trail fest. Oh, of course. So, you know, it's kind of <laughs> like a, you know, it's not like a Damascus, but uh, they were doing it one day, and we're like, okay, um, you know, we're twenty eight miles from there. And we got two days, so let's do a 21 mile. Oh, wow. And we'll just stealth, and then we'll have seven miles because they were running shuttles at the road crossing. Uh, right. Bennington, as you know, is five miles off the trail. That's right, yeah. But they were doing shuttles from 11 to 1. We're like, okay, let's do 21, and we'll bang out seven in the morning, get there at like, you know, quarter to 11. And we got there at like 20 to 11. There was already a shuttle driver there. and uh, Nice. You know, so we got the first ride right into town to, you know, to take advantage. And, and our plan was to go in, eat, come back out, and do nine more for a 16-mile day. Um, I learned a new phrase about you know, getting stuck in the vortex that day. And uh, <laughs> they, uh, the, the food have, was incredible. Have, do, you know, 
it happens, doesn't it? It's amazing how being stuck in the vortex for people who don't know it's when you go to a place, you can't seem to drag yourself away from it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, the guy I'm with, you know, I mean, six months ago, that would have never happened to me because I was kind of like a, uh, you know, okay, let's hike. You know, we'll stop for a 15-minute break and then keep hiking. And uh, mm. this guy I'm with, he's, he's ex- Solar is his trail name, and he's exceptional at it. And, like, by the end of the night, um, not only had we not left town and done another nine miles, but we were sitting in a movie theater in Bennington watching the new uh, Wolverine Deadpool movie. <laughs> so uh, it, it was – and then they had a park there for us where we could stay, and the breakfast – was incredible a, a huge huge kudos and shout out i mean for only their second year i mean it it was incredible it, it was awesome <laughs> and so where at, you're you're talking to me now from the top of a mountain i seem to I seem to remember yeah so i'm almost to the summit of bromley mountain which is in vermont <laughs> to, uh, just north of uh manchester vermont Right, right. Yeah, it's, I think, 16, 1660 Nobo Mile, I believe. Wow. Amazing, isn't yeah. it? And yeah. you've just met your, you just met your first sober as well, apparently. Yeah, yeah. July 20th, um, I met my first one. He had started on June 1st, which a lot of them, I met a young lady just today. Um, she started June 2nd. So a lot of those really early day one or day two uh, Katahdin opening, you know, we're, we're sure. starting to meet. Yeah, which sure. is kind of cool, which is cool. And do they, uh, because to, to me, going south, you know, you've got the tough stuff first. How was that? What was their impression of that? Yeah, a lot of them, uh, of course, you know, my interests lie in the 100 mile wilderness because I, you know, that's my backyard. Um, so I yeah. asked I ask them a lot of questions about that, you know, like, how is the trail maintenance and stuff like that? And, uh, but no, they, they uh, you know, not many, well, the people who don't know, so Mount Washington on New Hampshire is just like one of the craziest. Even though it's only 6,200 feet, it's one of the craziest weather mountains, I think, yes. in the country. Um, in the world. In the in, world. In the world, yeah. And, and, and only one in three days is clear. And I have not found many people that have had a good day. So I'm hoping. I had I had a good day. Did you? Okay. In my set, 2019. In fact, we went up. Then we took, the, we took a lift down. And then we got a lift back up again. So our second day was clear as well. So we had two straight days of clear. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I did in 2020, I had a friend who, who did Sobo, um, even though it was pandemic year. And I did that presidential stretch with him. And it was we could see we, we were going Sobo. We got up on top of Madison and we could see for miles. And it was just lovely, incredible. So I'm hoping, uh, you know, the people that I'm hiking around, a lot of the people I'm hiking around, I've never even been to Katahdin, which, you know, just gives me goosebumps thinking about them seeing that the first time. Um, but I'm really, um, really hoping that they get a clear day on, on Washington and along the ridge and everything. So, so what was their impression of those of the hundred mile wilderness and and those early early miles? Bugs. <laughs> well, you know, it is it happens. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, I, you know, that's the tough part about starting, and that's well, that's the reason why I don't. I think it's so tough going Sobo because in June in Maine, like I don't do. I mean, I live there. I don't do much hiking. Um, but they love the rivers and the streams. I mean, you get a little bit of everything hit at you right at the, you know, because down when you start down south, there's a lot of the same in different sections. You'll hike for a few days and oh, everything's yeah. the same. But, oh, yeah. you know, 100 mile wilderness, you get rivers and streams and ponds and lakes and mountains. So it's pretty cool. They kind of get everything at once. But uh, no, just extraordinary. Uh, you know, anybody who's out here and doing this, they're having a good time. And you've apparently found the best pizza on the Appalachian Trail. Yeah. So uh, spill the spill the beans. So we did. It was another one of those days where we decided to just, you know, stop early. You know, Solar had the great idea again. And uh, we went into Salisbury, Connecticut. Uh-huh. And people say, oh, you say the best Sunday and the best this and that. They're like, of course it's the best because you're on the trail. But no. I mean, I've had my <laughs> fair share of pizza out here. Anybody who follows my channel knows I have a pizza about once a week. Um, but it was at Neos, N E O S, Neos. And huh. it was the, I mean, it was I've ever had in my life, I promise. That's a, that's a national brand. I've had a Neos down in Florida. So really? I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I thought it was like an yeah. independent, but we had stayed at this lady's house. Uh, you know, she just rents out rooms. Vanessa Burton, she's on Far Out. And right uh-huh. in front of it was this place. So we went for lunch. Oh, perfect. Yeah. We went for lunch and we're like, wow, that's really good. Let's go back and. It was funny because we got a large pizza as an appetizer and split that before our meal, but uh, <laughs> but it was it was incredible. 
and it wasn't even we did uh, solar's a vegetarian so it was like all you know like just vegetables and stuff but it was just unbelievable so i i encourage everybody salisbury i think it's only a mile off the trail um or even less so i encourage you know if you're near there and you're sobo or no boat man stop there for pizza if it works out for you nice and nice. i'm not paid and... no it's an unpaid uh, you know <laughs> advertisement there they're not to give me any yeah with we know that, but you know, I think it's always good if you t- if you find something you like to tell people you like it, just so they try it out themselves. Now, the um, you're in Vermont now. You you talk about you talk about a note to me of the Massachusetts trail maintainers. Is this something you're? Uh, I know this is something you're interested in generally. Um, talk about the trail maintainers there then. Unbelievable, excellent trail maintenance throughout that entire state. I didn't really, I'd never hiked in New ha- uh, in Massachusetts before in my life, so I didn't really know uh. what to expect at all and it was i mean it was on point i mean it was really really great maintenance so i just you know i just want to give them a shout out um luckily I, luckily yes huge kudos luckily i met a few of them actually there was a one lady um her name her trail name's going to come to me but she's uh part of the amc in mass and she uh-huh. and her husband uh did uh trail magic actually even one day uh-huh. for us and uh we were you know i was just telling her wow like such an incredibly great job on the trail so i really liked massachusetts that was a great yeah great you know state. funny we don't not many of us get the chance to meet trail main, maintainers when we're out there i did a couple of times and i always thank them for it and i and I hopefully we've said it enough on the program how grateful we all are that people do take the time to get out and maintain a train but now you're in vermont you've talked about going home through vermont i didn't quite understand what that meant yeah so it's kind of a it was kind of an inside joke a little bit but uh Usually when I go, you know, when you drive home to, uh, whoops, is that me? Yeah, you've turned on to oh, fa- hang, FaceTime. So hang, hang up on me. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, usually when, <laughs> you know, when we travel anywhere from Maine, you know, we come home and it's Massachusetts and you go 95 and then through New Hampshire and then Maine. Like yeah. v- Vermont seems a real roundabout way. And I had a couple of buddies who, you know, they're not really into hiking or whatever, but they're following along my channel or whatever. And they're like, well, uh-huh. why do you have to go through Vermont? to get home why don't you just cut up through massachusetts and new hampshire i'm like well there's this thing called the long trail and you know they want it over two thousand miles so uh, i just thought that was kind of funny that people were asking why i had to go through vermont so you're getting close now you're getting close how far away are you from the border i think the border is about 1700 miles i think yeah new hampshire yeah so we're um uh shoot so we're we're gonna be at 1660 and All I right. think uh, Hanover is, I think we were planning on being a Hanover around August 4. Right. So about Not five long days, now, then. four or five days, I Getting, guess. You get, you know, and, and as you're coming towards the end, you've still got a lot of stuff to do, obviously. And it's, and it's a lot of it's, obviously, this is the tough stuff coming up. But how are you feeling about the prospect of finishing? Uh, very good. And, and I think a lot of that has to do, you know, we all know you can slip and fall and that ends your hike at any moment. But, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think, and I put in my notes that, you know, I was still hearing the music. I heard this lady talking about, uh, it wasn't even in regards to hiking, but it was just when you're in, when you love something, there's a passion, you can kind of hear the music in your head, you know, every morning. And, uh, and the thing for me is that, you know, that now I'm getting close to my support network. Like yeah. I've, got, I've got somebody meeting me on Thursday at a road crossing. I'm spending the night at a friend's house in Hanover. Uh, I've got another friend who's, uh, he offered to slack pack us all the way from Hanover to Lincoln, uh, <laughs> which I don't, th- I don't think I'll take him up on. I think that we are going to do it one day. Cause I just want to experience what slack packing is like, oh, yeah, uh, you, know, you know, and then on the other side of, uh, the whites, you know, I'm going to meet my wife cause I haven't seen her since April 8th. So that'll be pretty cool. Uh, um, yeah, you nice. know, it's just every step. I mean, I'm going to do well, I'll have maybe a one day food carry through the hundred mile wilderness. So how uh, come? Well, uh, I've already got, you know, I know all the roads up there. So the first night, uh, we're going to hike 15 miles and my two son-in-laws are going to meet us with pizzas and beer um, <laughs> at that long, at long pond lean to 15 miles in. Right. And yeah. then, you know, the Katahdin and Ironworks road, we're going to have breakfast, yeah. big breakfast cook out there. And so. Uh, you're, you're, you're platinum blazing it then for, for New Hampshire and Maine, aren't you? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, on, on trail blazing, I guess, on trail platinum blazing. I'll be staying at in my tent and lean to it, but uh, yeah, I'll have stuff being brought to me. I might as well take advantage of the sport. So the music in your head's getting louder and yeah. you're excited, no doubt, and you're going to see everybody you love and your friends and so on. But 
are you looking forward to this being over now or are you looking forward to just enjoying these coming weeks uh, and making sure that you get every last minute out of it or are you actually sad that it's going to be over soon? Yeah, probably out of those things, probably B and C. I think, you know, uh, I'm definitely going to, I hate to say the word slow down, but because, you know, I mean, we're doing 20 miles some days, but uh, yeah. really just enjoy it. You know, to your point, just milk every little morsel yeah. out of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I stop and talk to people whenever I can. And I just get to meet people and uh, and then definitely I'll, I'll be sad. But, you know, this guy I've been hiking with solo, we're, we're already talking about doing the Camino, Camino next May. So, nice. You know, nice. so yeah. when you have other things to look forward to, especially with the relationships, I mean, I know you've, met people out here that you, you still talk to to this day i'm sure oh, of course of course yeah, yeah. and hike with yeah, yeah and i've got yeah. you know i've got probably five to ten people you know probably a day ahead of me or day you know professor milkshake who's on your yes. show i mean yeah, I, yeah i've been texting with him he, he's like 13 miles behind me i think last night so uh, oh, right, you know, right. you know, just a great you I tell you, the example you gave earlier on about stopping in a place and getting into the vortex, which was kind of you would the vortex is about a four or five day event sometimes where people go to a place and stay there forever, you know. But going to going to see a movie, it's just adapting on the fly, enjoying that moment while you can, and just don't look at it as wasted time because you're not hiking. It's part of your hike. Get that, you know, you'll think back whenever you see that movie in the future, you'll think back to yourself, I did that on the hike. And that would be an important movie too because I feel exactly the same way about any movie I saw on the hike. It feels like an important part of my hike and I, and I always have that feeling when I see it on the on the on the movie screen or the TV that yeah, I did I watched that when I was actually hiking. So, you know, it, embrace that i'm sure you already are oh yeah yeah the toughest part of the movie was staying awake because it didn't start till 6 45 so <laughs> <laughs> so it got so it, so of course it's hike a bend up for you guys when it gets dark yeah so <laughs> yeah it was, <laughs> so, no so the we, we paid extra for those reclining chairs oh, dear. Say, but, uh, That's but funny. no it's, That's it's funny. been going it's been going great and, uh, you know it's everything i dreamed of and more honestly you know what? That should be all anybody needs to know. You know, the fact that it's more than you dreamed of, because all of us dream of, about what it's like, but we never know what it's going to be like until we get out there. So you're living the dream, and, and, I, and I appreciate you keeping us up to date with it, and we'll catch up again soon, okay? Yeah, yeah, I'll end with this. I got a nice message from someone, um, actually a, a brother of my one of my son-in-laws, mm -hmm. and he was just saying, you know, how inspiring it's been. And I told him, I said, you know, I said, I kind of started this hike for me as a challenge for me, you know, yeah. and it's turned into so much more than that. You know, when you hear people saying they're getting inspired, inspired from it and stuff. So it's really cool. Yes. Oh, no doubt. And uh, you, you, you'll be surprised at the number of people who will talk about this to you once you've stopped telling your stories, which remember is only about three weeks after you finish. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, you know, they will come back to you and say, you know, you, you got me out here. Or, you know, you got me hiking. So, you know, good on you. All right, man. Uh, well, look, thanks, good to talk to you. And we'll catch up yep. again soon, okay? All right. Talk to you Cheers. soon. Bye-bye. Cheers, and Bobby. Bye. Bye. You know, I absolutely love it when I speak with somebody actually doing the hike at the time we're speaking. I can imagine myself up the top of Bromley Mountain because, well, I've been there. And I had to laugh when he talked about getting caught in the vortex. I remember, particularly in my 2019 through hike, the Standing Bear Farm, which was just out of the Smokies, was a place where hikers would turn up and stay for about five days. That place has such a vibe, and it was then that I first heard of getting sucked into the vortex. Awesome. And don't forget to check out the pizza place, Neo's, in Salisbury, Connecticut. Look for Vanessa Burton's hostel in Far Out, and you should find it near there. Before we hear from the next class member, I wanted to shout out, as ever, to our critically important donors. This week, the following people have stuck with us for another month. Our friends at Small World IFT, Michael Garsh, Kevin Eastman, and Ann Dobson. Thanks to you all, and if you're getting something from the show, why not send a donation yourself? You know how to do it, and I'll be very appreciative. Cheers. Now, and I think this is only the second time we've heard from her, here is Sandra Lee. She's got a bit of news, but as you'll hear, it, it isn't exactly as I gleaned from the text she sent me. Here's Sandra. Hello. Hello there. How are you, Sandra? I'm doing well, Steve. How are you today? Well, I'm fine, but we've got something to talk about today, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. <laughs> it's so, been a busy period. 
Yes, I'm sure it has. I got a, uh, a text from Sandra the other day saying that her plans have changed. So tell everybody what happened. All right. Um, we, I, I, I'm hiking with my husband, Trail Horse. So we were working our way through the whites and the presidential range. I was doing about one mile per hour, working really hard to do that. And, um, and he and I uh, had like um, an agreement to, to, to hike within six months, uh, do this hike together within six months. And I think after a few injuries, like my kids bothering me, he was concerned about a knee injury and I was recovering from a cold. Um, and my pace was extremely slow. Um, but you know what? Hang on. It is, hang on. It is, it is through the whites anyway. My pace was one mile an hour through the whites. Oh, fantastic. Well, he wanted to go a lot faster. <laughs> right, right. Okay. <laughs> and I think what happened is after I fell a couple of times, he was a little concerned. Um, and so we made a compromise so that we could keep hiking together. Because one, one idea was to split, and I, and I suggested he just go on without me. Um, I think after I fell that second time, he was a little concerned about leaving me alone. So, um, sorry, I'm in downtown Port Royal. Charlie's passing by. Um, so we, we made a compromise. In order for us to keep hiking together for six months, we were going to do some jumping around. Um, and what we so- did is when we got... So hang on, are you saying, because my impression was that you've given up on the through hike, but you um, were going to do some back and forth and so on. But that, that doesn't mean to say, doesn't mean to say you won't necessarily finish, does it? Correct. Correct. So we we are unsure if we're going to finish the entire Appalachian Trail within the 365 day window. Um, right. But but we do plan to complete over 1,900 of it within six months. Um, so hang on then. That's interesting. So, I mean, as you know, and I'm glad you pointed that out, you've got a whole year to do this. So you're saying that this six months, we started when, by the way? When, when did you actually start? We started in April 21. Okay. And what have you done so far? Okay. So, so far we've completed everything between Harper's Ferry yep. and – and the presidential ridge, right? And, um, which is and, significant, by the way, a significant yeah. amount of hiking. Yeah, it 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 has been. It, yeah, it has been. Um, and, and oh, loved the presidential range. Absolutely loved it. Um, yeah. Then then oh, from Pinkham Notch, we jumped up to Stratton, Maine, and then we hiked the Bigelows in Maine. Right. So you've done quite a few of the good ones anyway already. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, then. Um, so what is the plan now then? So your your plan is to do nineteen hundred miles in six months, but which means you've only got three hundred miles to do. I know the winter will take you out for quite a bit of it, but you could do yeah. that probably in about a month and a half, maybe two months from February to April next year, couldn't you? That's what we think. We think there's a two months um, that I that, that I've left undone. It would take me two months to finish the last two hundred and eighty miles. Um, so we'll see. Uh, you know, it's 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 still a through hike up through April twentieth, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so you know, I'm I'm glad you said that because I misunderstood that. I thought you would you were done with this because you said that we, to keep you know to keep the short. You said we made a compromise and have turned this through hike into a walk in the woods, which <laughs> which made me laugh out loud. By the way, <laughs> good. <laughs> and and so, I who's who's um. Whose idea was it to do this hike in the first place then? It was my idea. It was I my request it was. to do a, do a full through hike. And right. it turns out that my husband is a hiking machine, but I'm a little <laughs> bit slow. I'm a little bit slow. And, and, and we, we noticed that down here in the southern part of the trail, we actually hike together. I'm, I'm faster and my fast pace is acceptable for his slow pace. So up uh, in the tough area, up in the tough area, um, it was it was difficult for him to go that slow to hang with me. Right. Okay. Well, it, well, you know what? It may not have been a bad idea for him to hike on and get to camp early and just wait for you, because you know this yeah. isn't a this is not a race. And you, I know I'm sure when you're hiking with somebody, one of you feels pressure, you know, in, su- in in some <laughs> way. And I'm sure you feel the pressure in some ways as well. So, you know, it's one of those one of those things you you might want to consider. You know, that it's. Just accept that it, one goes faster than the other one, and the other one gets to camp earlier. Doesn't matter; it's Correct. safe enough. Once you once you get out of all the tough areas, it, it's safe enough anyway. So, tell us about the presidential range then. Oh, it was so fantastic! Frank, like, like I, I, we already talked about Franconia Ridge, but presidential range, same thing. Those epic views when the clouds parted. There oh, were so. quite a few clouds, 
Um, and what we learned was, um, and our, when we went through it, the mornings were very socked in, but the afternoons, the clouds would break up. And what nice. happened is, is we arrived at the lake, um, was it um, um, Lake of the Clouds Hut? We arrived sure. there around noon. And, and what we wound up doing is we dropped our pack. We decided to stay there for the evening. We dropped our packs. We went huh. up to we went up to to the peak of Mount Washington without our without our big packs, yeah. and um and and it, it was still kind of cloudy, but at times you know, the clouds would part and be able to see a little bit. But at huh. least we got to see the summit without it completely socked in. And it was huh. and then we, we made a loop. Then we um made a loop and we went we went you know past the summit and there's a little gri- uh, um, a blue blaze that, that we were able to cut back and come to the Lake of the Woods. Lake of the Clouds. Yeah, Lake of the Clouds. Lake of the Clouds, thank you. And so the next morning, we put our packs up. We still went, you know, you went, you go about two-thirds up to the summit. But uh-huh. in the morning, we were able to skip the summit because we had the opportunity to see it in the afternoon, take your time. We let, you know, when we went up there without our packs, we got to lounge, take our time, find the yeah. hyperbook. And yeah. It was really nice not to have the, the pressure of time. So it was a neat little thing we did that if anyone has the opportunity to do that, it's a fun way to go up to Mount Washington. And so in the morning, we were able to complete our circuit by going back to that blue blaze and then picking up where we had left the trail the day before. So it was a neat little loop we did. Um, so in the morning, um, because like I said, it, it, ta- it was taking me all day to, to, to get 10 to 7 miles. So we were able to, by doing our little, uh, so I call it a slack pack to Mount Washington, we were able to linger up there and have a good time. You know what? That's everyone come to this hike in their own way, and this is your way of handling it. It still seems to me you could very, very e- not easily you could very much get it done, but you know you've got to enjoy it anyway. And you said you said that you went from um, you went from Stratton, Maine to Caraton, and you took six days off trail. So what was what? Yeah. What do you do in those six days? In those six days, we um, we you know, shuttled to Bangor, and then we rented a car. Um, we had to take care of some business down in Brunswick, Georgia. Um, so we drove all the way down to Brunswick, Georgia, oh. spent about 24 hours there taking care of um, some things with our home, and then um, then came back to D.C. and uh-huh. caught the train uh, into Harper's Ferry Thursday evening. And um, from the train, we, uh, we uh, grabbed a, a meal in a restaurant, and we walked one mile on the Appalachian Trail so that we could pass our beginning spot, which was Jefferson Rock. So we passed right. Jefferson Rock and went to the Quality Inn and stayed there for the night. And so Friday, we began our southbound hike in earnest. So Friday morning, we got up, and now we are in front of oil. And how, are you enjoying it, by the way? I it, it, am. I, and the reason I say this is because I know that a through hike is important. The, the, the designation through hike is important to a lot of people. Do you feel disappointed uh, or do you yes. think yourself self this is a thing that we needed to do because it's the right thing to do okay so at first when we were in Caratunk and we made the agreement to go ahead and flip back to start the southern half so that we could finish it by um, October 21 um, uh, I honestly I was depressed and I think that's probably just good to share that I went I went through 24 to 36 hours it's a short period but I w- sure. I felt the full-on depression um, mm-hmm. I was very sad about um, – I luckily have been to Katahdin before. I summited Katahdin five years ago. The year you did your hike, I drove up there and, and got to just do Katahdin. Nice. Um, but I, I was bummed about not seeing the 100-mile wilderness right now and doing Katahdin. Um, at first, I was just going to um, have 130 to fill in, and now I have 280 to fill, uh, miles to fill in. I was. I was depressed, but – after you know, a little time passed, and I got to talk about it with a friend of mine too. And she's like, you know, you're what you're doing. You talk to non-hikers. They're like, this is fantastic. What you're doing is just above and beyond. And just talking about it with somebody, I started feeling better. And then, and then now that we're hike, you know, now that I'm back hiking again, I have a plan. I'm looking forward. I'm probably going to make it to Springer. But we decided six months in six months, wherever we are, we're getting off. It doesn't matter. But I think I can make it. And um, now that I have a plan and I'm enjoying this hike south, I'm enjoying it so much. I'm, it helps with the depression and, it, and, it's, and I'm feeling much better for it. And, and well, what, is your, was your husband comfortable with that decision when you – I mean, that must have been a tricky conversation. Did you – who broached the subject? 
Okay, well, at first, um, it was, we were coming down Madison in the presidentials yeah. when, um, tough and, it. Um, tough it. <laughs> <laughs> that is a tough one. It took like five hours to do three miles. I mean, yeah, it was yeah, a tough yeah. one. Oh, you, sp- you and- sped then. You sped. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, and, and that's when it first came up. Um, he, he admits he, he, he about had it. Um, he was a little frustrated with our speed and, um, he was a little frustrated. And that's at that point when I decided, um, well, uh, I felt like our relationship is more important than a through hike is what it came down to. Of course it is. Of course it is. And to be honest with you, it does test the relationship. I'm sure being out there, even with people you meet on the trail and become hiking buddies with, you know, so the fact that he's your spouse is is an important thing to get that bit right as well. What I would say though, is if you're going to finish a through hike, you kind of want to get Qatar and done this year, don't you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what you could do, it was October the 20th, First is your last day. You could, on something like the fifth of October, get back up and do the hundred mile wilderness in Katahdin. Why not? Yes. Then, it, then it's yeah. out of the way. Yeah, yeah. So that's I'm, I'm thinking. We're going to kind of see how this goes, is, and then we get, might get to a certain point, and and maybe maybe they'll knock something out. So did either of you offer to let? Well, in this case, it would be your husband. Did you say to him, "Do you want to go on by yourself"? We had those discussions before because at first, okay, when we first got onto the trail, he could care less about finishing. He's like, I'm just here to be with you. Huh. And, and, and it kind of comes down to remember um, this phrase you use a lot that I, that I, that I mentioned last time, this has got to be the one thing you really want to do. Sure. And, sure. Um, and so for him, he's here for me. And he said he was, he's been frustrated for a while and, um, and he's been really trying to keep it quiet, but you know, when you, when you know someone well, you can see the signs, you can yes. see the signs. And I knew he was frustrated. The heavy, um, the heavy sighs and the exasperated look. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we did talk about one time we did talk about splitting our gear up and just going separately. And I was fine with that. But I, I like I said, I think in the whites, he, well, I was recovering from that cold too. And the whites, I was not my best. I was, I was probably a little pitiful. And and he just wasn't comfortable with leaving me alone. Plus, he wants to be with me. So he was really torn between that, too. And that's why it came down to this compromise was, okay, instead of splitting our gear, let's stick together and see what we could do. You know what? Let, let me make a prediction right now, then. I would say that the two of you, when you finish on April 21st, uh, sorry, October 21st, and I say I strongly recommend you get the 100-mile wilderness of Qatar and You'll love that as a hike anyway. You will ha- you'll have your legs. You'll be strong enough to do yeah. it. And yeah. then you, you'll, by the time you get there, you're going to want to fill in those other miles. You just are. I, I guarantee at least yes. one of you will We've want to get that done. That. <laughs> right, right. Well, look, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad you came on and told us about it because, and I want to carry on following you because I still think you've got an excellent chance of getting there. Just think about a plan that still makes this work for both of you. Because it, Thank you know, it can it can do, and you're going to get stronger, and you will get faster. And once you've got your legs, get through the hundred mile wilderness of Qatar, and then you got to just fill in some tough miles, but some great miles as well. So you yeah. know, don't I don't consider it's over yet. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. All right. Well, look, good to talk to you, and you know, just keep heading south, and we'll catch up in, in a week or two time. Okay. Okay. All right. All right thank you. Thank you, Steve. Cheers then. Bye. Bye. So Sandra has definitely become my latest project. I think I've given her a way to get this done within the allotted 12 months for a through hike. So I hope she thinks and plans to get it done in the coming months. If you recall last year, Jessica Lang Wright seemed pretty unlikely to finish for so long. Yet she got there. Never underestimate a determined woman. I've added a picture of Sandra and her husband to the show notes as I forgot to do it last time. I've also added a link to her blog. And talking of determined women, let's catch up with Emily Leonard as she passes the 100 mile mark and fills in a few more details about herself and her faith. I'll see you next week. Chapter 6 100 Miles Sunshine led the way the next couple of days. The terrain was easy. My feet enjoyed the low mileage days and our hiking bubble seemed more like family than strangers we'd just met. I hiked alone most of the time. Gilligan and Mozzie hiked ahead. Throughout the days I leapfrogged with other hikers as well. The first two I met were collecting water from a stream that emptied itself over the trail from the right. They highly recommended I camel up. 
Camel up is a hiker term meaning hydrate as much as you can when water is available. It's easier to carry inside you than on you. I never refused a good water source. When they were done, I took my turn. Just as I was leaving, a trio of young college guys hiked up. One was from Texas, and the other two were from the University of Maine, my alma mater. One fellow black bear was studying photography at UMaine on a self-guided course while on the AT. The other fellow UMainer had a friend who was taking a class from Dr Butterfield, one of my professors when I studied there, and who still remains a dear friend to this day. What a small world. Here I was, out on this grand adventure for God knows what reason. Part of it was just to do it, but once out there I realised there was going to be more than following the Nike slogan. I liked the escape, but the deeper I got into the trail, the more I was reminded of home. I didn't mind. For some, it caused homesickness, but for me, it did the opposite. The connections I encountered were like God's way of saying I wasn't alone. Like meeting Carl or Walking Man, who were from Maine, and meeting the UMaine students. I may have been away, but home was still in my heart. The best reminders were all the flashbacks of Bruce. At home, I would be busy with this and that, with no time to ponder and reflect. But the freedom of the trail provided hours for such things. At one point, I passed midnight. He'd had a rough night and wasn't feeling so well physically. His body and feet ate more than usual. Midnight suffered from a multitude of war injuries. He was disheartened, knowing he had to leave the trail. That first night we met at Plum Orchard Shelter, he had shared with us that he was AWOL from a VA clinic. He had been in the hospital for over 18 months. They told him he would never walk again. Drugged up to control the pain, he had few faculties for decision-making. One night, with a change of staff, his medication had been forgotten. He regained his wits just enough to realise he wanted out of there. He called his daughter, who came and took him out without authorization. Going cold turkey from the prescribed narcotics, Midnight freed himself from the addiction. Medical marijuana became his go-to drug for pain control. I'm not an advocate of the substance, but even I noticed a difference in his ability to function without pain after a hit or two of his prescription. But that day, as I passed him, not much was helping his pain. I stopped and sat with him for a while. When I gave him a hug, he cried. He wanted so much to be healthy and to be able to function like he did before the war. I had all I could do to not cry with him, but he needed someone to be strong. I have a huge soft spot in my heart for our military personnel. Maybe that's why, without thinking, I reached over and hugged Andrew that cold night. I thought I was helping. Our service men and women sacrifice so much so that we can have the freedoms we often take for granted. More needs to be done for our men and women in uniform. That day, all I could do was offer Midnight a hug. As I left, I gave him a mini rosary my goddaughter had made for me. It was priceless to me, but I felt he needed it more than I did. March the 22nd was a great day. I saw a black baby bear. We passed the 100 mile marker. I climbed a fire tower. We stayed inside a real house. We cooked a real meal and I learned not to grocery shop directly after coming off the trail. My bear sighting was so adorable. A memory is all I have, no photos. So it's like the fish that got away. I was walking along the trail alone, completely engrossed in my own thoughts and in my own world, a common state of being for me on the trail. There were two other hikers about 30 yards or so ahead of me. I trekked forward, head down, enjoying the morning, when something caught my left eye. I immediately came to an abrupt halt. There it was, the tiniest baby bear. He could have fit into my hiking boot. I couldn't believe how close to the trail he was. He was just sitting there, like a little puppy wanting to be held. His eyes spoke to me and said, Please pick me up. I'm so lonely. My mummy left me. I want to cuddle and I'm hungry. I fought back the urge to do such a thing, in fear that Mumba Bear would hear him screech if I so much as touched a hair on his hide. I did decide to yell ahead to the other hikers to beware of Mumba Bear. Not sure how they missed baby. They were curious, though, and came back to take a peek. But that's all they did, and the three of us scurried out of the vicinity as quickly as we could. A little farther down the trail, we joined a few hikers who had stealth camped. We told them about the bear. They shared their story of how they heard a baby calling out. Then the mother bear called from the distance, in bear language, Shut up! Baby bear would be silent for a while, then call out for mummy and again be told to hush. They said it went on all night. My immediate thought was that it sounded so much like raising human babies. Another connection to life back home. It was so amazing to be in the midst of such wild happenings. I was grateful to my family for supporting me on this trip and mostly grateful to God. It was hard not to feel close to his presence out there, even in the misery. During those times I called upon him even more. 
just like Baby Bear calling out to his mother in the darkness of the night. But in the day when he could see, he was calm. I too called upon God to help me through my darkness, the pain of my knees and feet, and to help me through the cold and rain. When all was well, I didn't seem to talk to him as much. But that day, a day of lightness and joy, I made sure to give thanks for the good times. Early in life, I wanted to be a nun. That was every devout Catholic mother's dream. I was born and raised in the faith, making me a cradle Catholic. Going to church every Sunday as a family was what we did. There was no choice. Well, there was, but the alternative was not a selection one would freely make. Attending Confraternity of Catholic Doctrine, also known as CCD, was a must. Confraternity of Catholic Doctrine is a fancy term for Sunday school. In my youth, there were times I rebelled at CCD. I wasn't a terrible youngster, just a little too talkative, and I gave my teachers a hard time. That's what everyone else did, and I wanted to fit in. It's not that we were horrible, we just pushed the boundaries. Looking back, I enjoyed my time learning about faith. When I was in junior high, I asked my mum to take me to a convent so I could experience religious life. Request granted, and off to the beautiful coast of southern Maine, where Sister Marita, a friend of ours, lived in a convent on the beach. Sister Marita, who was from our community, would always take the time to talk with me when she visited our parish. I admired her, and it was so much fun visiting her at the convent, learning how I could devote my life to Jesus. After that visit, I was convinced that was what I wanted to do. I loved God and helping people. I thought I felt a calling. Nope, wrong number. Somewhere between that visit and 8th grade, I discovered boys. They were pretty interesting to me. Not sure exactly when I went from beating them up on the playground, not really your typical nun behaviour, and outplaying them in gym to wanting them to like me. No more convent visits were in my future. So went my mother's dream, washed out to sea. Dances, first kisses and boyfriends were capturing my attention. Unfortunately, I was not capturing the eye of the other sex. Guys were not too thrilled with the memory of years before when I would chase them and beat them up. Besides living in a small town, most classmates and neighbours were more like brothers. One guy did catch my eye though. He was tall, cute and tough. Just what I thought I wanted. It took me three long years to wise up and realise he was not Mr Wright. Sometimes I think I wasted those years and wish I could undo the pain I caused my parents. But those were learning years. Even though religious life ended up not being my vocation, my Catholic roots run deep and I'm so thankful that going to church was not an option. By making us attend Mass and CCD, Mum and Dad were planting the seed and even though it lay dormant for a few years, it was still alive, waiting for its time to grow and bear fruit. If there was one thing I learned from all those years in faith formation, it was that there is a God who loves us deeply. Heaven is real, and those we love who have passed on are there helping and guiding us. I take comfort in knowing that Mum knows I'm sorry and I do love her. My failures are part of my past and part of the person I am today. We cannot change the things we have done, we can only learn and grow from them, using the knowledge and experiences as a trampoline to propel us to a bigger and brighter future. Everything that happened in the first couple of weeks on the AT were stepping stones towards success. All of it, the good, the bad and the ugly. The first milestone was 100 miles. Wow! It seemed like we had accomplished so much. Albert Mountain was the second peak over 5,000 feet elevation so far. At the top stands Albert Mountain Fire Tower, number one. It was built in the 1950s to replace an old wooden fire tower on Standing Indian Mountain close by. The tower was used as a short-term living for wardens. I'm not a fan of high places, especially high places on top of higher places, but I did climb that structure. I always enjoy the view once I make it to the top. It's getting there that's the difficult part. After Gilligan's and my excursion up the tower, we enjoyed a snack at the bottom with fellow hikers. We then continued the almost six miles down to Rock Gap Shelter, where we thought we were going to spend the night. In the morning, we would hitch a ride into Franklin, North Carolina. Andrew arrived ahead of me, as usual. While he waited, a man named Colin was there, drumming up business for the home he was renovating to be a hostel. Our original plans were to stay at the Budget Inn, where we had our drop boxes, but the timing was good with this guy. When the opportunity struck, we took it. The idea of a real house and a home-cooked meal versus a hotel room and restaurant made for an easy decision.